about the Mona and I will tell you about 30 Kanaka huddled shivering in an empty parking lot praying that Lahui would answer the call. I will tell you about two nights hot sleeping directly under a sky scattered in stars, in air so clear every inhale is medicine. How every morning I woke to a Lahui Kanaka growing as if we were watching Maui fish us one by one from the sea. Me and I will tell you how on the third morning I watched this 30 became 100, then 100 became a thousand, then a thousand became us all. Ask me, and I will sing the song of our Manawahine, linked arms and unafraid, who stood in the face of a promise of sound cannons and mace. Ask me, and I will tell you that I have been transformed here, but I won't have the words to quite explain. I will say, I don't know exactly who I'll be when this ends, but at the very least, I'll know that this Aina did everything it could to feed me, and that will be enough to keep me standing. I think about my role as the poet as having power to make people feel. If it doesn't bring a tear to your eye, if it doesn't conjure a memory, if it doesn't give you chicken skin, the poem's useless to me. A poem is as good as it resonates. And when I find resonance with people, I feel affirmed. Um, I feel a pilina with them. Pilina is the word that we use to describe any kind of relatedness. But it also means to be like stuck to something. I think we're starving for intimacy, generally, as Hawaiians. Even more so, there's been this incredible disruption of pilina in ourselves, our land, and the people around us. Between 1778, when Captain Cook arrived, and the overthrow in 1893, we lost 90% of our population due to disease. 90% of our population just died. That's an apocalypse. The world transformed and the ones who live struggled through this incredible transformation of land and resources and rights and privileges and living on their land. We are white people, native. This is our life. So there is a history of exploitation that mirrors what's happening on the mountain. For the last 10 years, a conglomerate has been trying to build a telescope on top Mauna Awakea. This would be the 14th telescope on that mountain built without the consent of the Hawaiian people. Mauna Awakea, the fight to protect her. I don't think any of us are anti-telescope, but I will say that Hawaiians understand that science that requires desecration is not ethical and it's not science, it's development. We are not American! We are not American! We are not American! Raise your hand if before reading for this class, you had never heard of or experienced the wonderful, exciting trauma that is Honanike Trask. It's a travesty the way that I grew up being taught about poetry because I thought it was the dumbest thing in the world. I thought it was useless. I thought it was old white dudes meditating on their perfect old white dude life. Um, so why would that have meaning? It's not relevant to anything I was experiencing. It couldn't talk to me as as a young queer Hawaiian woman and help me understand like that I was okay. Then when I was 16, a friend introduced me to SLAM and a whole new world of poetry opened up for me. I was hooked. By the time I was 18, 19, I was writing almost exclusively about Hawaii. So colonization, the overthrow, annexation, the loss of our language, the loss of a lot of our cultural practices. 
For a long time, I didn't ever want anyone to read my poetry because I grew up in a Hawaiian language immersion school. My concept of my spelling and my grammar is like, that's atrocious. And that used to really bother me because I, I thought it meant I was stupid. So I didn't want people to read the poems. I just wanted to perform them. The sea is rising and in my tiny Honolulu town, that means underwater homes, there was a wall of water taunting my home life. And I was really lucky that I kind of got pulled into this slam poetry competition. We three in life. We come in three stutter at the finality of the pattern. One stop, two, three. One stop, two, three, three. The poems were so close to me that I wanted to perform perfectly, not just to win, but to like do justice to the poem. At some point it became really clear that I could talk about Hawaii on a microphone. And if I did it as a poem, people would listen. Like I could get a lot of people to listen. What happens to the ones forgotten? The ones who shape my heart from their rib cages. I want to taste the tears in their names. Trace their souls onto my vocal cords so that I can feel related again. But our tongues feel too foreign in our own mouths. We don't dare speak out loud. So we can't even pronounce our own parents' names. And who will care to remember mine if I don't teach them? This is all I have of my family history that's real. And now it's yours. O Elroy Thomas de Aloha Ozorio Hekane, O Clara Kule Ke Hevahine, No Pulawa Ahano Io, O Jonathan Ke Kamakaviva Ole Ozorio Hekane, O Jonathan Ke Kamakaviva Ole Ozorio Hekane, O Mary Carol Dunn Hevahine, No Pulawa Ahano Io, O Jamaica. Heoli Mele Kalani Ozorio Hevahine, do not forget us, my poina. The poem I performed at the White House took 10, 15 minutes, right? So the good poems come fast. They just like fall out of you. To write from a place of inspiration, it's like fast paced, your heart rate shoots up, like there's actual adrenaline involved. That can feel really invigorating. I was really lucky to have a lot of those moments that I thought that that's what writing was and it made it really hard to have the discipline to keep writing when I didn't have pure inspiration. I think that's part of the reason I, I stopped writing and performing. Not only did it become kind of a chore and even like a pressure to produce for other people, but I felt like I had run out of things to say and I had run out of new ways to say old things. People would ask me to perform somewhere, and I would want to say no because I hadn't written a poem in three years. So then after months and months of waiting, we got the call. And so our people, we packed up our bags, we stepped away from our jobs because the TMT was going to start construction again on Mauna Kea, and we decided that we weren't going to let them. So to block the transport of construction equipment, a group of us chained ourselves to the cattle guard on the Mauna Kea access road. We've been here since about 3.30 this morning, locked in, and they're about to dispatch the police officers to come forcibly remove us. This is an invitation to, to share this message, um, to come down and, and bring your mele and your aloha and your kapu aloha uh, to, to come malama kia aina and aloha kia aina. It's already happening, massive disobedience. We cannot allow this to happen. TMT must go away. TMT must leave Hawaii. My brothers, where's your hearts? Let them be. You choose money over us, Kanakama Ole. How can you do that? Look what we have to do. You guys make us do this. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Commitment the fifth. 
Laka Kapuaiva, Hawaii Ponoi, a new national anthem, a new symbol of strength, a new promise to the Kanaka Maoli of Kalakaua's generation that like those before, they will stand and fight for their right to Noho Aupuni today. We call this resistance. Back then, we just called it Pono. Being there, I had voice again. I had something new to say. I've written a lot of poems for the Mauna this week. Um, I might just read them. Ask me about the Mauna, and I will tell you the mo'olelo of eight kanaka chained to a cattle grate, and the kokua that sat beside us. Auntie says she sees hope in me, and I watch her overflow. Says she dreamed of this day. When you write a poem or a song in Hawaiian, it's no longer yours. You don't have ownership over it. It belongs to the person you write it to. That's kind of the, the beauty in all of this. All the poems I'm writing, they belong to Mauna Awakea. To me, in many ways, they're all just the same poem. Mauna Awakea and I are, are getting to know each other. You know, it's like falling in love. This morning, all I have is the magic of a Mauna, caught in the sight of the sun as we are teased by the treachery of time. All I have is the honesty of this weight, weighing minutes stretching across the hardening curve of my spine, all my words caught in the cracks of my breath, hands curling into their own heat. This morning, I have nothing here to hold you with, and you, still as constant as the summit, with all your magic rising beside me, holding out your hands to catch everything I am, am and not quite yet.